Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is John Herbst. I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. Uh, we have an absolutely critical event for you today. Moscow launched its major offensive on Ukraine just two days ago. Fighting is happening throughout the country. The position of Russian forces around Ukraine has given the opportunity to strike in several directions. Ukraine is fighting valiantly, and we've got lots and lots of smart people to help describe what's going on for you today. Uh, we've got Hanna Celeste, an actually crackerjack analyst, uh, who'll be reporting to you from Ukraine. We've got General Ben Hodges, I hope, a uh, three-star general um, in charge of U.S. forces in um, Europe um, in the past, and a great expert on Ukraine and on what's going on in Russia as well. We've got Ben Jude, the author of many prom of extraordinary books about um, Putin's Russia and very talented on these issues. And of course, we've got Paula Dobryansky, a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council, a former undersecretary, who's been working on these problems for over 30 years. I hope you don't mind my mentioning the amount of time, Paula. Uh, I've worked as longer than you on these issues. Okay. Hey, John. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we are good natured as well as smart. Okay. So we'll start with you, Hanno. Tell us about the situation on the ground from what you can see. What do we know about major Russian operations and what are the Ukrainians doing now? So first of all, the situation is changing almost every 30 minutes. I'm talking with the different colleagues and friends, family around the country, and that's definitely like just one information in 30 minutes receiving completely different. It's not because we don't know, but because the fighting in different places are happening uh, very heavily. Uh, that's why the situation can be um, change, can change very uh, quickly. So uh, as for now, we have the most difficult fightings. One is near Kherson, uh, that is the uh, uh, city near the Crimea, because Russians are trying to get access uh, uh, from Crimea there. Then we have very heavy fightings near Kharkiv and Sumy, that is the eastern uh, um, uh, northern part of uh, Ukraine. Uh, today, they targeted a lot of, of the civilian objects over there, including orphanage where 50 kids uh, are being at that moment. And unfortunately, we have quite a number of killed uh, uh, during this attack. Uh, we don't know the final number yet because we are still trying to get uh, all the information from Akhtirka. Then we have the whole day of fighting at Chernigov that is just in the middle of the country on the north and uh, uh, plenty of military activities around the capital. Uh, with the general idea of uh, uh, Putin and his people are shouting that Ukraine needs to surrender and receiving completely different and opposite reaction. That is interesting that in his latest statements, Mr. Putin said that probably it is time for the Ukrainian forces to get uh, uh, power in their hands, probably thinking that Ukrainian president uh, um, too violent against uh, Russia. The problem is that if Ukrainian military, according to the mood that we can uh, follow now, they would definitely uh, start the uh, counterattack, not just the defensive. Because what we see now, it's not only the armed forces working on their full, we see the territorial defense forces of Ukraine uh, having lines of people staying for hours uh, trying to sign the contract with the territorial defense. And uh, that is interesting that many of them are sent to come for tomorrow because it's just technically impossible to accumulate all these um, efforts in many cities. The same is happening in the places where you can give your blood. Uh, people have been standing in the lines for five hours to get their time and possibility to give the blood uh, for uh, possible reserves of the blood. And in general, that is quite an interesting that people in Ukraine are feeling now the outrage and determination. Uh, panic was a little bit yesterday. Today, definitely some people are moving from their cities, trying to escape, to evacuate. This process is happening, especially those with the small kids. But in general, uh, it's a, a very strong moral stance and mobilization of everybody, from those who can help uh, with the uh, moral cocktail Molotov to those who are very careful on the streets. There have been reports in different towns how just people without arms been dearming Russian soldiers and uh, just beating them because they came to their town. And it's been reported to video quite a even funny, I would say, video sometime because it showed that when the person is at uh, his or her land, that is definitely the uh, uh, situation when they have more power than anybody coming. 
but why I emphasize this uh, that um, we already had quite a number of Russian soldiers and officers being uh, captured, and uh, uh, that is the videos of their testimonies, and that is quite an interesting that most of them are reporting that nobody said to them they are going to fight against Ukraine. They were sad that they are at the military drills. And uh, for some of them, uh, uh, for example, a few that have been captured near Kharkiv, they received information that it is Ukraine attacking Russia, so they need to protect and defend Russia. So complete misinformation. And as soon as the Russian forces are getting more of the real situation and real resistance, they are becoming quite a demoralized, as we see. That's really interesting. Um, we also had the report, uh, actually two days ago, about the capture of a Russian reconnaissance platoon, uh, I think it was in Chernihiv, um, and how they yes. were told they would... Um, what, can you tell us what happened with that? Uh, that is, uh, they were not just captured, they even surrendered, so it was almost voluntarily that they came. Uh, by the testimony that their commander gave that they were sent to Ukraine for the reconnaissance, not telling that it is the war. So it been just after the first uh, uh, missiles shelling, but without this uh, uh, field operation yet. And uh, nobody said the real goal of the reconnaissance operation for these guys. They've been said that it is exercises and they are sent to the territory of Ukraine just as a matter of exercise. Uh, that it seems to me it is just a disgrace to the uh, commander of uh, these uh, uh, officers because uh, they need to know what they are doing and why they are doing it so to make their decisions. That's amazing. And um, we had that extraordinary example of Ukrainian valor on Snake Island. Could you describe that too for our audience? Uh, for those who don't know, the Snake Island is an extremely small island just 30 miles from Odessa. Uh, closer to the Romanian territory. Uh, we didn't have any civilians there, just uh, those who've been with the uh, lightning and with the, um, uh, the border officers. So uh, yesterday, the two Russian ships came there and uh, started to speak that uh, they need to surrender. The guys replied to them uh, very unpolitely where they should go instead of uh, uh, being surrendered. And uh, uh, after these, the heavy shelling started both from the airplanes and uh, from the navy ships. We know exactly about 13 border officers being killed in this strike, uh, but uh, we didn't have any connection after these. Now, some information started to come in the social networks that Ukrainian forces returned back control. I can't confirm it yet because it's appeared just when we've been already talking with you. So probably in an hour or two, we will know exactly what is happening around Nini Island as for now. Okay, thank you. Uh, let, let's turn to um, Ben Judah. This could be the largest war in Europe. Actually, this is the largest war in Europe since World War II. Uh, what's at stake for Europe in this? I think what's at stake for Europe is uh, simply enormous. And what we are likely to see at the end of this war in the estimates of the various Western European officials I've been speaking to over the last few days is a new division of Europe. On one side, there's going to be the uh, Kremlin's uh, forces and vast swathes of uh, Ukrainian territory under Russian occupation. It's now clear as day that Belarus is a society effectively under Russian occupation. There'll be a new division uh, with where those Russian forces line up. But on the other side will be the free societies of Europe. And the expectation is that uh, European governments in the United States are going to need to start thinking very quickly about what support can be offered to the Ukraine that survives, either as a smaller rump state or hopefully a larger one. What can we do to support uh, this society under sustained uh, uh, attack or under increased pressure from uh, Russia? What lessons from the Cold War can we learn? If we kind of look around uh, Europe and how it's sort of reacting right now to what's going on, we've seen movement in the uh, last uh, 48 hours as the shock of the invasion has really changed minds and focused them in Paris, London and Berlin. In London, we saw a sanctions package that where people like myself might not think it goes uh, far enough, really deals a decisive uh, blow to what's been known as London grad, the sort of money laundering enterprise that the City of London has been uh, undertaking through its lawyers and bankers now for uh, a generation. You know, there's a wide sweeping sanctions there which are being drafted and are going to be uh, implemented soon. 
the British government, which thinks that it was right to be way out ahead in terms of getting arms to uh, the Ukrainians, in terms of calling for an end to Nord Stream 2, in terms of calling for Russia to be kicked out of SWIFT, is now uh, hoping to lead the charge against any creeping normalization with Russia over a fait accompli. So that's what London's thinking about right now. If we look in Paris and in uh, Berlin, there's been some positive uh, news with both governments saying that they are not, as Biden uh, told us yesterday, uh, opposed to Russia being kicked out of SWIFT. So that's a very uh, important step that's been taken there, signalling that much harsher sanctions could be on the way to the Russian economy. Then and you both, said Paris and which else, what other capital? And uh, Berlin have really? said, their finance minister that's said that really they are new. not opposed to kicking Russia out of SWIFT. So that's been an important development uh, this morning. In both Paris and uh, Berlin, there's a kind of strategic reassessment going on right now, a lot of deep thinking, because in the previous uh, decades, we've seen mostly Germany and occasionally France try and play the role of chief Putin wrangler for the West. <laughs> That's the role that Angela Merkel perfected, and she had a lot of power in Europe and in the European system through possessing that. And a lot of what's been going on over the last few years is Macron trying to seize that role for France. You know, now it's been clear that that role is not going to exist in the same way, it's not as valuable, and there's a reassessment about what these countries' big geostrategic pictures are to look for. The resistance to sanctions is primarily coming right now from Italy, and this has been a very disappointing moment for uh, people who follow the career of Mario Draghi, uh, the sort of favoured son of the economist or the uh, FT, I might say, I might say uh, who has been dedicating his time as Ukraine comes under uh, assault to making sure that he secures a carve out for luxury goods from any sanctions uh, package that the EU implements on, uh, uh, on Russia. And he has been very uh, hostile to matters concerning SWIFT or matters concerning uh, energy sanctions, making sure that he puts the Italian economy first. Okay, Ben, thank you very much and very good news on Germany and Berlin. Okay, General Hodges, great to have you with us. I'd appreciate your take on the military situation right now in Ukraine. Uh, John, can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you wonderfully. All right. You, you look good standing there as we all sit. <laughs> well, um, I really want to say thanks to Tallahassee Community College. That's where I am here in Tallahassee, Florida, um, participating in a history festival. And we were able this morning to talk about, to use what's going on in Ukraine in the Black Sea region right now as a, a living current example of the impact of history and the, and the misuse of history um, and, and why, why it all matters. So, um, so that's why, that's why I'm, I'm here. So uh, the last 48 hours seem almost like 48 days. I mean, there's been so much uh, activity, so much reporting, just like everybody that's listening right now, we've been paying close attention to the reports, the conflicting information, um, and for everybody that knows somebody personally that lives in Ukraine, um, it's gut-wrenching to know, to know the threat that they're under and to see our, our old friend Hanna Shales there uh, alive and vibrant um, is one of the things that gives me hope. Um, I've spoken in the last uh, few hours with uh, two different people that live, that are inside Ukraine right now, giving reports, and of course, um, as is always the case in war, that with the fog and friction that's there, getting accurate information about what's happening is always a challenge. Uh, but it seems like there are a lot of places uh, where the Ukrainian forces are having success. Um, I think that uh, it's actually better than what is than how it looks on uh, the news here. It's not. I, I heard a journalist today saying that Kiev is already completely surrounded, and I. No, man, they haven't even got there yet. I mean, they're, but I mean, there's so much of that kind of information. And I think it's important that we uh, continue to uh, reinforce uh, and support Ukraine um, because there is still a lot of fighting there. When I see former President Poroshenko walking around with an AK-47 with his fellow uh, soldiers in the battalion he's joined and President Zelensky with a helmet out there seeing the troops, um, that, that gives me some hope. But clearly, uh, they need help. Uh, the number one thing that they need 
is Stinger or some sort of shoulder fired uh, weapon system that can knock down drones and that can knock down helicopters. Uh, Russian Spetsnaz are being moved around almost at will by helicopter uh, because there's no there's not much of a threat against them anymore. And that, that gives Russian forces a lot of flexibility uh, to do things. Uh, there was another report that I received this morning that a new Russian element is moving out of Belarus directly south, not towards Kyiv, but towards Lviv. Um, and the purpose of that uh, operation would, of course, be to isolate Ukraine from Poland, to, to sever uh, the land, uh, land routes that, that would be used not only for refugees trying to get out, but for resupply of, uh, even if the US and the UK were to, were to give more weapons, it's probably gonna have to come over land now uh, or else through contracted aircraft. So that's gonna be uh, a challenge. Last, last thing I would say is, uh, is to sanctions. And of course, sanctions is not my particular expertise, but one of the guys that I talked to today reminded me that uh, Ukraine has some of the largest deposits in the world of certain rare earth materials. Uh, some of them up are not too far from Chernobyl. Uh, and they are billions and billions of dollars, potentially, whoever controls those uh, deposits. And so that somebody said, well, that's probably part of the reason that Putin is not too worried about sanctions because he's about to be the owner of the world's largest beryllium uh, deposit. So this, this is part of what's at play. So if we can follow the, the trail of who buys beryllium, I mean, and, and figure out a way to put the squeeze on uh, the Russian government there, I think that uh, what Poland has done to say that Aeroflot can no longer fly through Polish airspace that's not inconsequential. And I think if every country in Europe and the United States begins to say no more Aeroflot, I mean, these, these are uh, the steps that I think can be taken um, that help, uh, can change the thinking and behavior. If nothing else, these things tell our Ukrainian friends that uh, the West supports them uh, and we're gonna do everything we can up to the very limit of what our president will allow us to do. Ben, thank you very much. That was great. Paula, uh, you know, we, we've, we've seen a, a growing debate in the United States about what's happening in Ukraine and American interests there. Um, what is the stake the United States has in Ukraine and why should Americans support Ukraine at this moment? Uh, thanks, John, and thanks so much uh, to you and the Atlantic Council for holding this forum extremely timely this morning. Um, there are a number of core factors as to why Ukraine matters. First of all, the fact is, is that Ukraine is of geostrategic importance. It is located right smack in the middle on uh, the crossroads of Europe and if you will, into the Asian region, uh, of course, uh, connecting into uh, to Russia, but beyond. So it is of geostrategic importance to us. Secondly, why does it matter? The fact is that the United States has certainly been supportive of and signed on to a number of international and regional agreements, uh, whether it be at UN, Helsinki Accords, uh, the Budapest Memorandum. All of these agreements have called for, in some way or another, directly or, broad, broad, or more broadly, a respect for Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty. And from that perspective, we have a stake in this. The United States, uh, uh, why it has been a global leader is because we have upheld international legal agreements and documents. So here we have a responsibility. We are a stakeholder in seeing that these, uh, this commitment that we've made is in fact upheld. Thirdly, and very significantly, if the fact is, is that Russia uh, and Putin can just take up arms, uh, move aggressively into Ukraine, uh, and we've witnessed, of course, the illegal annexation of Crimea and the occupation of Donbass, and now the movement to encircling and occupying Ukraine, uh, seeking to occupy uh, Ukraine. In this case, what's the other stake here? Well, the other stake here is the concern is what's next? Um, uh, the Baltic states, 
uh, have been targeted uh, by Moscow. There have been cyber attacks, uh, Poland itself. These neighboring countries are in NATO. We have a commitment to NATO. And so there is the concern about the kind of hostilities and aggression that can go beyond. And by the way, I would also take that even further, further in the context of the globe is watching, watching what the United States and the West will be doing in this case. And so what we do will matter for other regions. Certainly the Chinese are watching, not only with respect to Taiwan, but also more broadly. And finally, let me just also uh, say here, you know, this goes to the heart of the fact that peace, stability, security has been maintained through an architecture, a post-World War II, a post-Cold War European architecture. And we have a stake in that. Our security also depends on that. And in this regard, this is outright aggression, brutal aggression, uh, which must be combated, combated and which must be uh, 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 certainly uh, uh, prevented. Um, uh, and the strength of our actions will matter here. Thank you, Paul. That was wonderful. Okay, Hannah, uh, you described earlier uh, the strong resistance on the Ukrainian side. Um, what do you think Ukraine needs, especially from the United States, but from the West, in order to be able to continue this resistance and ultimately win in these very difficult uh, circumstances? There are several levels of assistance that Ukraine uh, is already in, in need or would need very uh, soon. First of all, is definitely a military assistance, not only sharing of the intelligence information, satellites, uh, um, uh, all other information that we are receiving, but you understand that the ammunition that we received, uh, uh, the weaponry we received, they, it's in need of ammunition because it's really very heavy fighting happening. So additional uh, supply to what we have as for now. The second is Ukraine really need the no-fly zone. And uh, uh, that is important because most of the attacks are happening through the missiles and uh, uh, with the aircraft. And that is important to protect the uh, sky of Ukraine. Then the uh, Ukrainian may need uh, very soon the uh, uh, petrol uh, for the machinery and uh, the medical assistance uh, and uh, the uh, uh, humanitarian aid, because you understand how many people are now moving to the Western regions of Ukraine. It's not only support for the armed forces, that is support for those people who needed to evacuate uh, themselves from the Eastern part. And in terms of the international level, except of those work that uh, already started within the different international organizations with picking Russia off uh, and uh, uh, all these deep concerned statements, what is good, the sanctions should be really targeted because uh, each time we are hearing about a model of the sanctions that would be implemented and then somebody is coming and saying three oligarchs is under the sanctions. Honestly, it is perceived quite um, strange sometimes, but also as with, for example, yesterday's sanctions, they should be explained better because many people here don't understand what does mean it and they um, they don't understand the seriousness of those actions that are not happening. So uh, um, no, then uh, we need the work with media, because unfortunately we have quite a number of the international media that are um, uh, falsifying reports from Ukraine that are reporting completely strange things. I just been in one of the Washington studios uh, two days ago, and two people sitting opposite to me on the screen, they were extremely pro-Russian, saying uh, not just Russian myths, uh, but just the outrageous things like that it is protesters been killing themselves at Maidan and so on. So something that I don't remember for the last eight years being in the media. So uh, then cybersecurity, you know, uh, even the uh, Polish uh, um, officials already called for the hackers uh, around the globe to join Anonymous and uh, to start assisting both with the protection of the uh, cyber because a lot of critical infrastructure depends on it and uh, uh, with the let's be honest offensive operations because currently military and government depends a lot so probably Russia needs to receive uh, the counter attack as well because they are targeting with the cyber attacks a lot of the Ukrainian institutions right now. All right thank you let me just ask one follow-up question since you referred to sanctions how was President Biden's um, appearance yesterday an announcement of sanctions received in Ukraine? 
Uh, not bad, but let's be honest, uh, uh, he's been talking in the general terms and only in an hour when we had the text and experts started to explain it, it became a little bit more understandable. Because uh, uh, let's be honest, most of the people don't know what it means sovereign debt. And is it dangerous or no? Is it serious or no? And when he said uh, some officials and their families about whom he's been talking about, I understand that that is definitely not for the presidential address to uh, uh, speak all these details, but probably some explanation should uh, come immediately so to be better understandable of what is going on. All right, thank you. Okay, Ben Judah, um, you described what Europe has done thus far to deal with this latest bout of Kremlin escalation. What should Europe do now? What, what are the things they need to do now to help this turn out right the right way? I think there's a real moment where us in Europe need to think about our fundamental geoeconomic model and how it has enabled the Kremlin's war machine. And I mean that in three pillars. I mean that in a financial pillar, we see that the British establishment, the British elite, and also to a much smaller extent, those in the Netherlands or in Switzerland or other financial hubs has been offering these fundamental professions, lawyers, bankers, access to the city of London as a corruption services industry for the Putin elite. And we are going to have to change our model. We're gonna to have to close that down. The second, key model that we're going to have to look for is even more difficult to look at, which is that we have refused, despite deep warnings over the last few decades, to accelerate our transition away from the Kremlin's hydrocarbons, which are now funding this war machine. There are some devastating statistics circulating on Twitter of the amount of money that uh, Gazprom and Rosneft have been paid in a 24-hour period alone by countries such as Germany or the Central European uh, countries. What we really need, and this is going to be extremely difficult, but it still has to be attempted, is we're going to need a moonshot of historic proportions to transition the continent away from a reliance on oil and gas towards nuclear energy, clean energy, green energy. One historical example that I find very inspiring, and yes, it does come from a previous era where we were able to build things more easily and at quicker scale without being trapped and bogged down in endless sort of reviews and cost overruns is the French Mesmer plan from 1973, which is when hit by the oil embargo, the French government led a historic effort to transition the country to a reliance on nuclear power. What we really need if we're going to look at this crisis honestly and strategically is something like that. And that's going to be very difficult given the uh, absurd situation we have where German and French Greens and German Greens, of course, in government uh, have opposed uh, nuclear energy, even though it's viewed by experts as an absolutely fundamental step towards achieving carbon neutrality. And then the third step, and this is where I want to bring up again, uh, Mr. Draghi's dedicated efforts yesterday as uh, Schelling uh, continued to secure a, a carve out for luxury goods from any potential sanctions is a lot of Europe's leading luxury goods suppliers, leading uh, craftsmen and companies. And this is going from the great ones like, you know, the sort of Gucci Emporium to many of our smallest kind of leading craftsmen and luxury goods suppliers across Italy, but indeed in the UK or elsewhere, have become hooked on supplying kleptocratic elites in Russia or China or elsewhere. And we're going to have to look at that model. And is that really a sustainable model if we've entered this long-term difficult period of confrontation and death in Ukraine? Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, General Hodges, uh, you alluded to problems of supplying weapons to Ukraine given the new military circumstances. Uh, there have been two reports in the American press overnight which concern me. One said that the administration lawyers are debating the legality of supporting a Ukrainian insurgency. Uh, the second talks about uh, Secretary Austin in Congress describing the difficulty of supplying Ukraine with arms and no statement, according to the reports, of, of course, we're going to make sure we get deliver those arms. So to me, these just look like the insufficient resolve on the part of the administration. Uh, 
I did an interview with CNN just an hour ago where when this issue came up, uh, it was brought up in the concept, well, we, the United States wants to avoid a confrontation with Russia. Okay, so here's my question. Uh, of course, the United States is not going to send troops to fight Russians in Ukraine. But during the Cold War, and the Soviet Union was much more powerful then than Putin's Russia is today, we had to confront Russia over Berlin twice, in 48 with the airlift, in 61 um, with the building of the Berlin Wall. And of course, we had to confront the Soviet Union over Cuba when they placed missiles and nuclear warheads there. Um, we were able to manage those confrontations and secure our interests. With that in mind, shouldn't we be insert, shouldn't we be making sure we are able to fly or not fly, put by land, whatever, supply weapons to Ukraine, even these circumstances, even at the risk of confronting Russia? Because confronting does not mean shooting at Russians. Please. Uh, Ambassador, I, I love your uh, reminding us of the history that, um, you know, we have in fact confronted a nuclear armed Soviet superpower in the past with huge risk, uh, but nonetheless, the United States was willing to do that um, using all sorts of different means and working with allies. Um, long thrust was the exercise that the U.S. Army did in Europe after the uh, Soviets first sealed off, uh, began the, the, the blockade. And so um, the, the president directed, okay, send a battle group to drive all the way from West Germany to Berlin. What an amazing test. I can imagine the colonel in charge of that thing, uh, his heart was in his throat, um, but the readiness of the troops to, to drive and to, and to uh, just like when our great Navy sails through contested waters to fight for international freedom of navigation and so on. Uh, I think this is part of what we've got to do here. Now, um, I think that the it won't be US Air Force delivering weapons in there. Certainly there are plenty of commercial means contractors that would be willing to fly, very expensive, but we would be willing to continue to fly into different places. It doesn't have to go into Kiev Borispil Airport. I mean, there are dozens of other places where they could deliver. Uh, supplies, I mean, I keep looking at the maps like everybody else, and 90% of Ukraine is still controlled by Ukraine, not by Russian forces, although, of course, Russian Air Force is uncontested there. Um, I think that we, I'm, in fact, I'm sure there are people that are figuring out how would we do this? How do we keep Ukraine in the fight with what they need? Um, I would propose that we also get Russia on the back foot, looking over their shoulder. I mean, I don't know what it's gonna take for Turkey to agree to close the straits to the Russian Navy. Uh, I would imagine that the administration is working very closely with them uh, to tell the Russians that if you do not allow ships to go into Odessa, for example, then there's not gonna be any Russian Navy transit of the straits. And of course, I'm sure everybody knows that earlier this morning, the Russian Navy fired on a Moldovan vessel that was approaching Odessa. I mean, this is the kind of authority that Turkey has um, as a means to uh, provide some order in the Black Sea region. It's the best leverage that we have over Russia. Um, I would think that any plan that we would come up with to continue delivering weapons would have to be done not just, it's not just about the trucks or the planes, it's, a, it's about working uh, as part of a more sophisticated operation that would cause the Russians uh, to do it. But one thing I should have mentioned at the beginning, uh, Ambassador, is uh, in, here in this first 48 hours, I do believe that Russian forces are underperforming and Ukrainian forces are overperforming. I mean, given the disparity in capabilities, Ukrainian forces have actually been quite successful in many places. And, and we're discovering that most of the equipment that the Russians are using, uh, it lights up. I mean, it catches on fire very fast, except for the T-90 tanks. And so uh, as news of this gets out, of course, the Russians will learn, but Ukrainian soldiers can take heart from that as well. Oh, thank you, that, that was wonderful. Anything you wanna add? 
I, I keep watching Belarus. I mean, there's got to be some way that we can put pressure. There's going to be this bogus referendum here, I think, in a few days or a couple of weeks. And uh, Belarus is magically going to become part of the Union state. And we're going to have thousands of Russian troops um, uh, living in Belarus, uh, potentially with their longer range weapons. That obviously puts a huge threat uh, on our Baltic allies and the Suwalki corridor. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to be able to uh, make it through the rest of the day after hearing Ben Judah talk about uh, Prime Minister Draghi and the, and the carve out for Italian luxury goods, uh, <laughs> preventing sanctions against that um, while you've got Ukrainian soldiers uh, that are getting killed uh, by Russian forces. Now, my last point would be I was also horrified to learn yesterday or two days ago that the United States is still importing Russian crude oil. I mean, today we are still importing Russian crude oil and, and there doesn't appear to be steps uh, underway to, to end that. So I don't know how we can wag our finger at Germany or anybody else when, when we're not straight ourselves. Okay, thank you. That was wonderful. Paula, um, we'll, we'll turn to you last before we then go to audience questions. So my question for you is, is the same as my question to Ben Judah. What should the U.S. be doing now to, uh, I would say, secure our interests as Ukraine fights Russia? Right, well, uh, several angles I wanna take this from. Uh, first, let me mention, because I think it's, it, it was wor it's worth noting, uh, the chairman, Senator Menendez of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, released a strong statement about what should be done. And I'd like to reference it because I think a number of items there are, are definitely need to be on the table. One of the first things in his statement, he indicates that all options uh, in terms of sanctions must be on the table. Uh, this means SWIFT should be on the table. I, I personally think that we should be going down that path. And I was very struck by what Ben had to report uh, 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 with regard to that in terms of a European perspective. But we should move forward uh, on that. Secondly, uh, in the statement, it also cited that with regard to the oligarchs, that, you know, there have been sanctions that have been imposed with regard to travel, some other dimensions, but it also stated that, look, there are a lot of assets that uh, the oligarchs and their families have. These assets must be and need to be targeted. And then also, um, uh, 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 thirdly here, um, is the issue of uh, sanctioning Putin which was mentioned uh, very uh, specifically. So with regard to uh, sanctions, the sanctions need to be broadened. They need to be deep. They need to be targeted. Um, let me mention two other areas that colleagues uh, as part of this panel have mentioned. Let me start. Both Ben and uh, General Hodges referenced the energy sector. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I think that there can be quite a bit of creativity in the sector. We already know the Atlantic Council, by the way, is a big supporter of the Three Seas Initiative and bringing American LNG you know, into Poland, which there was one uh, delivery that was made. Uh, one does not need to rely on uh, 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 oil and gas from Russia. Um, we've stated very clearly Nord Stream 2, there shouldn't be just this kind of tentativeness of, oh, well, we aren't going forward with a, you know, uh, the, 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 the lease. Um, out and out, there shouldn't be Nord Stream 2. It should be cut off, full stop. Uh, but here, there can be a lot of creative avenues. Uh, ben mentioned nuclear. I'd mention let's lift some of the regulations relative to US oil and gas. Uh, by the way, that doesn't mean that we can't be also environmentally prudent. I think we can. There can be a balance there uh, in that regard, but not to be exporting and be engaged in that component where we are literally constraining an avenue that, by the way, would matter greatly to Europe and which also would be beneficial to, to Europe. Secondly, let me add the general spoke uh, about in response to your question, John, a bit about some creative um, ways of getting in military assistance. 
I'd like to emphasize it isn't only about economic sanctions. I do think that clearly Putin responds to force, to strength, and here, in terms of looking at what are the concrete steps we can take militarily, not only in terms of ensuring that uh, the Ukrainians do, in fact, get the Stinger missiles, the javelins, which they've requested, um, uh, in this regard, they need more. It's, it's not just what has already been done, but more is needed in that capacity. The forward deployment uh, is absolutely crucial and essential. And, and, and let me also uh, add in this mix, um, I know it has uh, obviously consequences, but it was very striking to me what have Ukrainians appealed for? By the way, they've appealed for a no-fly zone. They look back at the case of what happened in Syria and at the time when Senator McCain was alive and he declared a no-fly zone. Um, a no-fly zone can be used in a number of ways, for example, of even getting in humanitarian assistance. So there are a lot of options on the table, John, and we've, we've been moving in the right direction. And there have been a number of sanctions in place that the administration has put in place uh, uh, that are uh, consequential, but much more needs to be done. Oh, thank you. That was wonderful. And because it was so wonderful, I'm going to give you the first question from the audience because it follows from what you just said. Uh, it's from Mitchell Aldrich. It is, in 1990, President George Bush, Bush the Elder, said of Iraq's conquest of Kuwait, this will not stand. Why does that attitude not apply to Ukraine? Well, first, uh, 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 my own view is that certainly that attitude does apply <laughs> by many of us towards Ukraine. And we're Everyone on this panel. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. Well, it goes beyond this panel. Yes. Uh, uh, and I'm very struck, by the way, did you notice, by the way, about the, the demonstrations that took place in St. Petersburg, yes. in Novosibirsk, uh, and they're continuing on. And also, I was very struck by what Hannah said. Hannah mentioning the, the, the military, the Russian military and what they're saying, how they've been duped into what kind of operation they're engaged in. And then uh, when, when realizing what they're doing, there's opposition. So let me just say, I do think that uh, this has to be, the word has to be gotten out. The first question that John asked me about why the United States has a stake in it, I think it's very clear why we have a stake in it. I think that we need to keep emphasizing it, but not just emphasizing why we have a stake, but we have to have our actions match that. So in this case, I think your, your question is very poignant. I, I believe that we do have to not look back and regret of what we did not do to help Ukraine at this critical time. Because by the way, it's not just only about Ukraine's fate. What happens now in Ukraine has ramifications for all of Europe and also for those watching this in Beijing, uh, in Iran, in North Korea, elsewhere, our actions really matter here. Thank you, Paul. Okay. I'm going to put together three questions because they all touch upon a similar theme. And this will be for you, Hannah. Uh, one is from Jack um, Kropotsky. He says, how likely is it for Ukraine to end up like Syria with the westward leaning groups in a smaller portion of the country? Then you have Turlock, Denihan. Uh, oops, no, no, no. Oh, it's for, from Patrick Dalzell. Do we think that Putin will be able to subdue Ukraine and impose a puppet regime? I'm unsure they can. If so, what will the butcher of Grozny do? And okay, yeah, actually, those two questions. Yeah, so yeah let's start from these. points of view. Yeah, first of all, about uh, Syria, that is completely impossible, first of all, because Ukraine is not divided as for now. Uh, the uh, strikes really demonstrated the unity in the country. And also because Ukraine is not completely homogeneous, it's not 100% Ukrainians. But at the same time, first of all, uh, most of the other, even the Russian ethnic groups living in Ukraine are supporting Ukraine now. And we don't have the enclaves living like in Syria with some tribes or some special religious groups. 
So it is just the natural composition, not only the feeling of the people that would make it impossible, any type of the Syrian scenario. The question number two is about puppet regime. The Russian Federation been trying to do it for many times. And we had information from the intelligence, some of them being published even in the media, about some names that Russians would like to impose. Uh, the question is that those names uh, that have been published that is not very popular people. You can see the ratings and ratings of their political parties. Nobody is uh, thinking seriously about them. So considering how strong is support and determination of Ukrainian people now, um, even if to take off to imagine Zelensky and to introduce even Yanukovych, it was the last name that we heard uh, previously, or others, uh, people would just not accept it. It's not something that you're just bringing the new leader that can negotiate a peace. You need to notice one interesting thing that most of the pro-Russian members of parliament, they just disappeared the last few days. While I screened today their social networks, I tried to find out what they're talking about the situation. Most of them are not posting anything since 8th of, uh, 18th of February, so for, uh, um, for the week. And uh, most of them were not present in the parliament when the parliament been voting first for the emergency state and then for the martial law in the country. So uh, that's really interesting when these people are now, uh, what are their thoughts and how you can bring them back uh, if they are not talking about dialogue with Russia, but they just disappeared in the most difficult time for people. Okay, thank you, that was terrific. Uh, we have a question from Jonathan Wigan, which I think is for Ben Judah. Why is it that there is such vacillation about excluding Russia from SWIFT? Not a single significant political figure internationally has given a convincing answer to this question. What is the downside for the rest of the world that is stopping this from happening? Ben, over to you. I think the answer is actually quite simple, which is there are a lot of European leaders and governments that have up until now hesitated to pull a cord that would effectively end the post-Cold War sort of way of life between Russia and Europe, a world of uh, transnational business, kind of mutual investment, of uh, purchasing of uh, oligarchs on holiday in the south of France or in London, because the consequences of de-swifting Russia is an effective end of that economic relationship and a return to a division of Europe in a in what in one sense you know there have been fears in uh Italy and in Germany that this could move could lead to a really painful um inflationary shock perhaps not as bad, but in some ways comparable to the 1973 uh, energy shock, if they suddenly found themselves unable to transact uh, energy payments. So that's where a lot of kind of concern and doubt is coming from. But one thing that we've already seen is as Russian forces move in, as war crimes start to be committed, as the true and terrible picture of what Putin is attempting to do comes clear, a lot of that is diminishing in government circles in Paris and Berlin, and I expect it to do so uh, further as matters get much worse in the days to come. Thank you. Terrific. Okay, we have a question from Dan Witt, which I think is for General Hodges. What is the risk of President Putin poking into one of the Baltic states to test the resolve of NATO? And also, are there renewed territorial risks to Moldova and Kazakhstan? And I should mention that um, Patrick Danzel and Jack Kuponsky asked similar questions. So Ben, over to you. Well, of course, there's always this risk of either intentional or unintentional spillover uh, into Poland or into one of the Baltic countries. Um, We've already had, I think, some examples of uh, Russian long-range weapons uh, overshooting their targets, uh, landing uh, near the Polish border. So I, I can see that that sort of potential. Uh, the fact that the Russian Navy uh, engaged a Moldovan commercial vessel earlier today that was approaching Odessa um, also demonstrates that the Russians are uh, dismissive of international law and they're gonna do everything they need to to keep uh, anybody from getting too close to what their operations are, too, too close to their operations uh, in the Black Sea and presumably in, in airspace. So the potential for some kind of incident is there. What, what I can't tell yet, uh, I just don't know, is uh, as Belarus be, 
um, is absorbed into Russia and the creation of the Union State, uh, what will these Russian forces that are in Belarus, what will they do? Um, what, what will their purpose be? And I think, I, I would say it's extremely unlikely that they would attempt to um, keep moving um, towards Kaliningrad, for example, to, uh, to cut the Sowalki Corridor. Um, it just seems really unlikely, but I've been wrong just about 100% of the time uh, so far on anticipating what President Putin was going to do because he's not acting in a way that we would consider rational. He's got his own, his own rationality uh, for what he's doing. And he may see that if he, he, he really did not, has not gotten effective pushback from us about Ukraine, he's going to get zero pushback after the Anschluss of uh, Belarus. And I think he will continue operating at a very unsafe, high level of risk tolerance. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see now. I guess one, this one is for Paula. Um, David Shaw asked the following. From a U.S. domestic politics perspective, how much chance is there that the U.S. public will accept the cost and economic impacts of maintaining sanctions over a period of time? For example, if Ukraine is fully occupied, and, he, and then he cites Trump's praise of Putin and Tucker Carlson's um, de deprecation um, of caring about Ukraine. Paula? David, uh, it's an excellent question. Um, I've been very struck by the unity of, of voices from both Republicans and Democrats uh, uh, looking at uh, those elected leaders, uh, members of Congress, mayors, among others, who have been very strong on this issue and actually have argued that the reasons why we have a stake in Ukraine, why Ukraine matters, how this has ramifications for US national security interests and, and all the agreements we've signed um, uh, are being part of a collective defense and no less the architecture of post-Cold um, uh, 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 post War uh, Europe. Um, and it struck me that all of them have called for various sanctions. And then at the same time, they also have talked about what the ramifications will be domestically for the United States. Um, of course, one of the things that is cited immediately is the price of oil and how at the pump, the prices uh, have gone up exponentially. I mean, now uh, oil, uh, the barrel, uh, uh, a barrel of oil is a uh, hundred dollars. Um, I think that what matters here is first that many of our elected leaders have spoken to the issue. They've explained why this matters and that there will be a period where yes, we will be affected domestically, but there are trade-offs here. There's an investment in ensuring that the tide of aggression is stemmed, it's stopped, uh, that we abide by what we have signed on to, and that in this case, uh, experiencing some uh, domestic uh, challenges and costs, that those are for a good cause, that the costs in the short term will reap advantages for the long term. But what I am especially struck by is the fact that, I mean, just this morning, in hearing uh, both uh, Republicans and Democrats who've appeared on countless television programs, I haven't heard one actually of elected officials uh, say that this is not a path we should go down and we should not be actually incurring some of these costs because what we can do, we can also figure out ways of alleviating those costs like in the energy space, as we've already discussed, uh, we can alleviate it by looking at alternative measures. Hey, Paul, thank you. Um, we have a question from Sydney Davidson, and I think Ben Judah, this is will give for you to you. Um, Sydney says, please address China's role in potentially offering a safety valve to Putin as an alternative market for Russia's commodities, oil, gas, bauxite, etc. Thank you. I'd like to just talk about the geoeconomic shock of this sort of more uh, broadly Please. and partially to answer the last question uh, as well is Please. I think we need to be very clear eyed about this, that there is going to be a major inflationary shock 
in Europe, and there will be an inflationary shock in the United States if sanctions continue to escalate, the war continues to escalate, and it will be felt by European uh, citizens and by American citizens. And I do think that that poses challenges to uh, the administration and to Western European governments uh, going, going forward. And I think that they need to be very forward in explaining that and in taking uh, measures to uh, control that. You know, Russia might well in the uh, next few days or weeks take retaliatory sanctions back against the European Union or the uh, United States. Russia has even warned uh, many points in the past that it could break diplomatic relations with the United States over de-swifting uh, it. We've already seen with the UK sanctions that Russia has taken some retaliation already. Russia has banned British airlines from overflights over Russian territory. Now that's going to put significant costs on uh, British flights to Asia. They're going to have to reroute through Turkey and India. There's already the question of uh, Iranian airspace uh, there. You know, we might well see uh, full um, uh, retaliation in blocking overflights to the EU and the US if matters uh, continue to worsen over the next few days and weeks, as I indeed expect that they will. We might potentially see Russia impose export bans of its own if um, matters continue to worsen and Putin thinks he's got nothing to lose. And something that I'm uh, thinking about a lot, and I think the administration can do work now to lead on, is as we all know, Ukraine is a major agricultural producer. Ukraine is one of the countries that feeds Egypt, the Middle East, Israel, Palestine, and a lot of the world's uh, poorest uh, countries, the world's most strategically vulnerable uh, or unstable countries could find their food supplies uh, shocked if the worst case happens or you know, maybe the best case happens and fighting is continuing and preventing the uh, harvest being uh, undertaken. So I think that's an area where the administration needs to uh, think uh, now and sort of lead on. On the case with China, you know, China does have capacities to step in for oil and gas rerouting for Russia, you know, and it does have financial capacities to help Russia reroute. For the moment, China doesn't quite have the depth of capital markets to uh, fully uh, step in, but it can go uh, a lot uh, of the way for now. That's my sort of understanding uh, of it. The big break that's going to happen and I think this will be a kind of decisive moment in the geoeconomic order looking forward, is that the um, electronics ban um, that uh, the administration is looking on has the potential, if fully implemented, to stop uh, Russians buying American electronics. And then we really have entered a world where things look different and feel different. You're not going to have a Tesla in Moscow. You're not going to have an iPhone in Moscow. You're not going to have an iMac. It's going to be like, you know, when... You know, the sort of, you know, I vaguely remember it from my from my childhood when it was a different world in Eastern Europe physically. And I think that's going to have a major shock on uh, how Russian companies operate and how Russians think about uh, themselves and their society. Thank you. John, can I can I just jump in just a 30 second footnote? Please. Uh, I think Ben well articulated in a and the robust challenges that will be confronted not only in the United States, Europe, elsewhere, but my response to that is I am very struck by the fact that already legislators, public officials are explaining what the circumstances are. I think that's what's key to this situation. I think if that explanation is given, I think the public, I don't make light of this, I think publics will understand, and uh, uh, Americans, Europeans will understand that some of these costs in the short term actually are for a good and important cause in our security. Well, Paula, um, it's now one o'clock, so you've had the last word. I apologize to the many questions that we did, for the people who asked questions that we weren't able to answer. Um, we're going to be doing another event on Moscow's war on Ukraine a week from today, and you'll all get invitations. So thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for our panelists for a wonderful conversation. And thank you especially to Hannah Celeste, who's with us under very, very difficult circumstances. Thank you very much. Uh, let's be safe because the shelling started and all that stuff.